Hi, so a quick revision of, of Mice and Men. In this case, it's the symbolism of cards. What I'm going to try and do is go through chronologically, um, for the most part anyway, and explore the significance of cards, and in particular Solitaire, to uh, the nature of, of Mice and Men's plot, its themes and its characters. So first of all, the description at the beginning of chapter two. In the middle of the room stood a big square table, littered with playing cards, and around it were grouped boxes for the players to sit on. Well, first of all, it's significant that uh, this table is placed in the middle of the room. It's the central focus for the characters. Cards are central to the life of the men, and gambling is one of their few means of escape from the mundanity of their existence. But there's something tragic about this. There's something quite hopeless and pathetic about it, because if chance and gambling is their one means of escape, Steinbeck is at pains throughout the novel, really, pointing out that there is no chance, there is no escape, that their lives are really governed by fate, and there's no way to escape that fate. So this gambling, this idea of chance, is a false hope, a false chance. Uh, the second thing is the word littered. Uh, littered has connotations of a lack of care, of disposability, of rubbish. It seems that the men invest their hope and their care in this means of escape, these cards, these, this chance, but it's a false hope. Later in chapter two, uh, George discusses Curly with Candy, and it states that he cut the cards and began turning them over, looking at each one and throwing it down on a pile. He's not playing cards, he's essentially just looking at them. And I would argue, and this occurs several times over the course of the novella, that the cards act as a kind of alienating device. They create a distance between characters. George intentionally isolates himself through the use of the cards by providing this object to, pro to produce a barrier between himself and others. They act as a kind of defence mechanism, so he doesn't have to fully engage with other people. He's not playing a game. He's essentially giving himself something to focus on rather than the characters that are around him. It isolates, it alienates, it creates distance. The main card game that's played, not the only card game, is Solitaire. So when George discusses Curly's wife with Candy, George cut the cards again and put out a Solitaire lay, slowly and deliberately. Purdy? He asked casually. Yeah, Purdy, but... George studies his cards. But what? Now, Steinbeck's choice of solitaire is going to be intentional. It's clearly symbolically significant, as it's a game that's designed to be played alone. Again, that sense of alienation and isolation is being reinforced by Steinbeck. Etymologically, in terms of the meaning of the word, solitaire is from the French meaning solitary. So that sense of loneliness can be articulated just through mentioning the game. And I would argue that it's a kind of symbolic manifestation of George's loneliness and isolation. It's particularly moving and ironic, given that um, he claims that we got somebody to talk to. This is the thing that distinguishes him and Lenny from all of the other ranch workers, according to George. We got someone to talk to. And yet, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, George plays solitaire in order to stop himself talking to others, in order to create distance. One of the interesting things about this description is the use of these adverbs. They are really heavily contrasting or antithetical, deliberately, casually. We have this contrast between the deliberate, purposeful way in which George deals with the cards and the casual way in which he talks. What we see is the deliberation represents the kind of attitude toward the situation that he's in. He is deliberate with the cards and is obviously reflective, but this casualness is mock. He wants to seem as if what he's talking about has no consequence, but we recognise that it does through the contrasting advert deliberately.
Steinbeck actually makes this explicit just um, a few lines later, where he says, George pretended a lack of interest. But we should have been able to recognise that lack of interest previously through this contrast of, contrast of deliberately and casually. It's worth recognising that um, in chapter 3, and this is where I'm stopping being chronological for a moment, we again get the same adverbs used. George asked casually, been any trouble since you got here? It was obvious that Whit was not interested in his cards. He laid his hand down and George scooped it in. George laid out his deliberate solitaire hand. The fact that those two words are repeated just a chapter later shows how carefully Steinbeck has considered their use and how important he feels they are. It's that contrast between the way the cards are played and the way he speaks that provides a sense of the way he talks and the way he feels. George laid down his cards thoughtfully, turned his piles of three. He built four clubs on his ace pile. The sun square was on the floor now and the flies whipped through it like sparks. The sound of jingling harness and the croak of heavy laden axles sounded from outside. From the distance came a clear call. Um, it's worth recognising that it's only when George kind of truly feels alone that he begins to actually play solitaire properly. The mood of the novella shifts at this point and it becomes more active, it becomes more purposeful as George himself gains purpose in the uh, playing of the cards. Soon after this, Slim comes in and leaned over the table and snapped the corner of a loose card. This is one of the cards on George's solitaire lay, and yet Slim feels able to reach over and grab one of the cards. Slim has power. Slim has confidence. Slim is the prince of the ranch. And we see that in the comfort that he displays in kind of invading George's personal space and George's game. His relationship with the card tells us an awful lot about Slim's character and the relationship between Slim and the other characters. Um, we could argue that these cards are a kind of an external manifestation of George's character. They represent something about him, whether it's his isolation, his loneliness, etc. But Slim feels able to intrude on that. I don't think it's an action that's designed to kind of intimidate, but it is an assertion of his power, of his status. I'm able to pick up your cards. I'm able to snap the corner. Uh, later in chapter 3, George talks to Slim about his relationship with Lenin. He states, George stacked the scattered cards and began to lay out his solitaire hand. The shoes footed on the ground outside. At the windows, the light of the evening still made the window squares bright. I ain't got no people, George said. And as in many other contexts, it's the laying of the cards that provides this kind of opportunity for reflection. Rather than being an awkward silence or a need to blurt out something, the cards provide that opportunity to have a focus, a distance, and for the characters to reflect and consider, or George to reflect and consider. It's particularly found when George is considering something a little bit distasteful or disturbing or something that's quite difficult or introspective. So, when Slim asks about the woman in weed, George carefully built his line of solitaire cards. He doesn't just respond, he immediately starts feeding the cards out, giving that opportunity to reflect. And that kind of slow process could be said to represent the nature of George's mind at this time. One of the most obvious times when the cards come into play is when Candy's dog is going to be shot. The silence fell on the room again. It came out of the night and invaded the room. George said, anybody like to play a little euchre? I'll play out a few of you, said Wit. They took places opposite each other at the table under the light, but George did not shuffle the cards. He rippled the edge of the deck nervously, and the little snapping noise drew the eyes of all the men in the room, so they stopped doing it. What I'd argue with this and what follows is that the cards act as a form of displacement. They provide a focus. They're not being played. There's no game here, really. They're not used to entertain, but they provide a focus until this tension is diffused, this profound tension caused by everybody waiting for the gunshot. Whip broke out, 
What the hell's taking him so long? Lay out some cards, why don't you? We ain't gonna get no, you can play this way. George brought the cards together tightly and studied the backs of them. The silence was in the room again. A shot sounded in the distance. The men looked quickly at the old man, every head turned toward him. For a moment he continued to stare at the ceiling, then he rolled slowly over and faced the wall and lay silent. George shuffled the cards noisily and dealt them. Rick drew a scoring board to him and set the pegs to start. So it's only when the tension's been diffused, when the cards as a kind of distancing agent, an alienating device, are no longer required, that they're actually used to play a game. This, for me, is the most important aspect of the cards and their symbolic significance in the uh, novella. Almost automatically, George shuffled the cards and laid out his solitaire hand, he used a deliberate, thoughtful slowness again. Then he reached for a face card and studied it, then turned it upside down and studied it. Both ends the same, he said. George, why is it both ends the same? I don't know, said George. It's just the way to make them. Now, I would argue that both ends the same could symbolise the idea of fate. We mentioned fate earlier. There is no freedom of choice, choice in Depression-era America. All people suffer the same fate. It doesn't matter how hard they work, it doesn't matter where they go, there is no opportunity. As Crook states in chapter 4, I see hundreds of men come by on the road and on the ranches with their bindles on their back and that same damn thing in their heads. Hundreds of them, they come and they quit and go on. And every damn one of them has got a little piece of land in his head and never a goddamn one of them ever gets it. Everyone suffers the same fate. No one has the chance to break free. The concept of both ends the same is absolutely crucial. And it's one that's really explored through a variety of devices within uh, the novella. So that, for example, the classic example is the novel's narrative symmetry. The novel begins and ends at the waterhole. Um, both ends the same, both the beginning and the end. It can also be in the seen in the symmetry of some of the chapters. Chapter 5 is the classic example. It begins in the barn, it ends in the barn. We've got the rattle of the harness of the horses at the beginning, we've got the rattle of the har harness of the horses at the end. We also see it with the parallel between Candy and his dog. Both ends the same. The dog gets shot. Candy wants someone to shoot him. Now, I know he says, you know, nobody's going to do that. But essentially, they are both old. Um, Candy's had the dog since it was young. He wants their end to be the same. So they're certainly both getting old and useless together. And finally, um, with Lenny and the dogs, you know, Lenny and his puppy, both of them meet um, a rather nasty fate. And also, Lenny is frequently compared to a dog. Uh, that sense of loyalty that sense of faithfulness, both ends the same. And finally, just to pick up on a few of those key points, um, I would say that uh, solitaire and cards together really symbolise isolation, perhaps George's desire to be apart from Lenny, or the isolation of migrant workers in American society as a whole. They symbolise loneliness, they symbolise fate and fatalism, that's just the way they make them. Both ends the same. And with both ends the same, it could refer to the ends of the characters, you know, their deaths, or their inability to break free, um, and the way their lives will all end up the same way. Uh, we need to consider how exotic and strange the characters find the idea of one of their own writing a piece for a magazine. Wits beside himself with um, excitement when he reads this, because it seems impossible that anyone could escape the kind of life of the ranch worker, and just a letter to a magazine seems to suggest that possibility. Uh, similarly, the idea of owning their own piece of land seems fantastic. To George it really is a fantasy, he never believes it's actually going to come true. Um, and it could foreshadow the parallel between Candy's dog and Lenny. Remember, Lenny's the only character who's not in the bunkhouse when Candy's dog is shot outside the bunkhouse. Okay, thanks.